A few weeks ago, I recorded a video on the conflicts that took place in what's now Indonesia from 1945 to 1949 that are known in Dutch as the Polichinelle Axis or in Indonesian as Revolusi Nasional Indonesia. And actually, there were loads of comments. Some were really nice with personal testimonies of people who knew other people and knew about the war that is always great to get. You know, there were other people that were just posting memes, but you know what? We love to see it anyway. And some really welcome corrections, like, for example, that I got the city wrong, which had part of it burned down. It wasn't Surabaya, as I said, but it was Bandung. And I always love getting these corrections because I do mess up and I do make mistakes because there's a lot of information to go through in a video like this. So I really appreciate it when people politely point out mistakes that I've made to keep other people informed and on top of it. Um, as well as the fact that I said Malay when I meant Indonesian as the language, which was a, a big derp. So I really wanted to start this video by just saying a thank you to everyone who has watched the video and shared it around and left comments and feedback because the vast majority of the comments were really positive, they were sharing stories, they were memeing around, they were starting discussions, being respectful and polite and that was that was awesome. What was also awesome was to see lots of Indonesians in the comment section. I don't normally get very many Indonesians so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say Selamat Datang and welcome you all to the channel because it's been great to see my analytics, the demographics changing quite significantly and you know really making an effort there as well as my usual top four which is which is always nice to see but this video unfortunately is going to cover some of the comments that were a bit less positive because there were quite a few comments as well that went along the lines of saying that it was a very biased video in certain ways and actually denying that any of these mass killings had taken place before the Dutch had sent soldiers to Indonesia, which was a large reason for sending troops as well as others. And actually in this video, I wanted to address some of these comments about why exactly the Dutch sent soldiers to Indonesia and specifically about some of the reasons that I mentioned, but perhaps didn't go into a lot of detail in the video. This isn't, by the way, going to be a video of me trying to claim that the Dutch were right, because looking back, I don't think that the Dutch were right. And certainly in the way that the war was conducted, I think a lot was left to be desired. However, this is going to look back at what the Dutch knew at the start, why they did send troops, and also why a lot of the comments that were made were quite poorly informed and why I think that might be. So... Let's get started. Really with this video, I want to take a look at why did the Netherlands go to war in the Indies? Why did they initially send soldiers over? I think the question changes when you ask why did they continue the war in various points? And I think that would warrant a different video and a different approach. But this rather looks at why initially they sent soldiers to the Dutch East Indies to fight there. And particularly to look at this idea of was it just greed? Was it just that they wanted the economic raw materials and resources and to continue a colony that had in the past leached off the local population, completely exploited them for their own economic gain? But is this also true for the initial impetus in 1945 to send soldiers to the Dutch East Indies? That's really what I want to focus on. To start off, it's of course important to note that the whole reason the Dutch were in the East Indies was because of the spices and other luxury goods there that could make them incredibly rich. And it, they profited from these resources at the detriment almost all of the time of the local population, just as is the case with all forms of colonialism. This doesn't mean, of course, that certain individuals and perhaps even all of the natives actually did benefit in some small ways from the Dutch being there, but on a whole scale level, the Dutch really were exploiting the local population, sometimes in a horrific manner, for their own good and the accruement of their own wealth, slowly capturing more and more of the islands and peninsulas there. And just to make it clear, what this video is not is me trying to justify Dutch colonialism in the East Indies or to justify all of the actions that were undertaken there. I think it's right that the Indonesians today are a separate state that the people can decide over their own lives rather than being exploited for profit from people far away, even though, of course, the story of colonialism is more complex than that. I still think it's not a good system 
and it's too exploitative it doesn't work well for the people who are being exploited in that way what this video what i want to accomplish is to look at how exactly indonesia got its independence and which leaders helped it to get there and actually whether this was the best road it could have taken. Of course it's the one we have now so looking back at Indonesia as a country is what we refer to as looking through a telescope the wrong way. We have the end result but we don't know how it started, we don't know exactly where it comes from and actually it could have happened in a very different way. And that's really what I'm trying to say here is, were the Dutch actions in sending soldiers, were they simply aimed at gaining the Indies for their own profit and continuing to milk it as a cash cow as they had done in the past? Or was it an effort to try and end other things that were going on there that eventually would have also led to a slower, more controlled route to Indonesian independence in whatever form that would have taken? Well, that's what I want to look at today. The 1942 Japanese invasion and occupation of the Dutch East Indies is really crucial to understanding why the Indonesian National Revolution took place when it did. And actually it's ground roots and in the nationalist movement that in many ways would, was shaped, certainly in terms of the Pemuda, the youth, this, this very violent period that occurred just after, which I will argue is a major prompter for why the Dutch sent soldiers to the East Indies and fought there is through connections to the Japanese in this period of the occupation. Now when the Japanese were invading they were very aware that they could tap into uh, native feelings of unhappiness with the racist Dutch system that was in place that distinguished between people based on their race. Dutch people were treated better than Indonesians, native Indonesians, and actually Eurasians, people of, of mixed race, were treated as being Dutch. So there was a lot of a lot of conflict and racial tension within the East Indies, although this was starting to die down by this period. It was starting to become less of a problem than it had been before in the 19th century. But the Japanese played into this and when they were invading they flew planes above many Indonesian cities and dropped pamphlets saying one colour, one race. Which you might think sounds quite similar to some of the rhetoric being spewed in Europe by Japan's ally at the time. And actually when the Japanese invaded the, the Dutch forces they pulled out, they mounted a brief resistance but it was really not very effective against the Japanese and they started to enforce a scorched earth policy and at this time lots of looting and violence broke out by many of the native Indonesian people in the wake of the Dutch and the advancing Japanese. This is taken from an article published by the University of Singapore written by Eli Tawan Bausma who describes what happened and specifically who was targeted by some of these robbers as they're described. The reason I mention these ethnic tensions between groups like the native Javanese, particularly some of the young nationalists and then other ethnic groups like the Chinese is because these will bubble up again later as you'll see. Now it's fair to say that most if not all the major nationalist leaders who would go on to declare Indonesia's independence collaborated actively with the Japanese to terrible effect for not only the native population, um, I say native as in the Javanese population, but also for the Dutch and Eurasians and others inside the Indies at the time. So, for example, Sukarno and Mohamed Hatta, these are two of the, the big leaders, the ones who declared independence, both actively worked with the Japanese and promoted the Japanese as a liberating force. Indeed, they thought that the onset of the Japanese would lead to Indonesian independence. And they thought that they were the light of Asia that would drive out the European colonizers. And they actively were installed in positions of power by the Japanese occupying forces. It's fair to say that the Japanese somewhat played these nationalist leaders into stringing them along so that they thought independence was around each corner while really they were exploiting the Indonesians as much as possible. Because they were driving for independence, they called up on the people to perform the law musa in Japanese, which is something like forced labor. Now, they were paid for it a small amount, which had been better than some of the services they'd done before. 
However, many of the people who went on this law, Musa, never returned. And actually, the native Indonesian population as laborers were treated incredibly badly by the Japanese. Sukarno was also responsible for requisitioning food from the countryside, which in 1944 and 1945 led to the deaths of 2.4 million Indonesians because they no longer had enough to eat and famine broke out because the nationalist leaders had supplied the Japanese with food and in collaborating with them they had led to this outcome. That's not saying that they are necessarily completely responsible for it, but they are also implicated within it because they made it possible for the Japanese to operate within Indonesia and they decided to align with the Japanese Empire. They were even awarded medals by the Japanese Emperor Hirohito for their service. In total, 4 million Indonesians died during the Second World War as a result of the Japanese occupation. That's a figure, an estimate by the UN that was given some years after the war. And really, by collaborating with the Japanese government, these nationalist leaders were partly responsible for some of these deaths, as I laid out, because they helped in establishing the Law Musha. They were trying to get Indonesians to join in this forced labor ban because they thought if they just played along a little longer, the Japanese would actually give them their independence. And Sukarno even later said that he thought it was necessary to do for the end goal of Indonesian independence. The Japanese also set up certain armed groups within the Indies um, and they were arming these for the event of an allied occupation and also later to fight back against the allies potentially in their own army if that was their long-term strategy such as the Peta, the Pembala Tana Air and again my Indonesian is awful so I sincerely apologize if I'm butchering these names but what's important here is that these groups were trained by the Japanese whose own soldiers were incredibly brutal during the Second World War. Mark Felton has a brilliant video on why this was the case, why the Japanese were so brutal in combat, but the fact that there were these groups that were trained by the Japanese in Indonesia that were then given free reign upon their surrender explains somewhat what happened in the period following the Japanese surrender when there was this power vacuum in Indonesia alongside these leaders that had collaborated with the Japanese, thinking them to be the light of Asia that would drive out the Europeans. This goes back to a point of that collaboration with the Japanese may not be the best kind of person you want in charge of a newly developed country. If we look at the atrocities committed by the Japanese throughout Asia, estimates range between 10 to 14 million people killed by the Japanese as they rampage through Asia. The accounts of which are truly horrific when you read about what Japanese soldiers and pretty much it was the normal Japanese soldiers going and doing horrific things to native populations and especially to European and Eurasian prisoners of war and civilians. It's quite clear to see that some of the Japanese xenophobia and martial mentality also infiltrated through to the Pemuda, who are the youth, these armed mobs that would rampage through the East Indies following the Japanese surrender in 1945 before the landings of Allied soldiers there. I think that's particularly interesting, but also to maybe question what this would have been like in Europe if there was a collaborationist state that had helped the, the Nazis fighting in the Second World War, whether they would have been allowed to stay. And I think we know what happened to collaborationist leaders in Europe that helped the Nazis. Even normal people that had helped the Nazis were often humiliated and some were charged and some were executed depending on how much they had helped. And I wonder how much this played a part in the Dutch decision to go back. Quite a few of the more negative comments on the last video said it's absolutely not true that it was the Dutch thinking they were going and fighting against the Japanese occupation. It was the Indonesians that wanted freedom and the Dutch were going to oppress them. However, it's quite clear when we look back that many, if not all, of these big Indonesian nationalist leaders had worked together with the Japanese and many of the more radicalized nationalists had the same kind of fascistic mentality 
and the same kind of training and indoctrination, which I'll, I'll move on to in just a second, that the Japanese had had. So I think when we keep that in mind, it is rather interesting to draw a comparison between the two. So to briefly summarize, the fact that now in Indonesia, the leaders who had been working together with the occupying Japanese for years and who had actually indirectly led to the deaths of both Eurasians, Europeans and native Indonesians, they, they had now declared independence to a Dutch government back in Europe might look a lot like this was a continuation of the Second World War and that this had been a product of a Japanese occupation. Now, it is more complex than that, of course. There had been nationalist movements before the Second World War, but there is also a grain of truth to this. The main leaders, Hatta and Sukarno, had worked together with the Japanese, with an awful regime that led to the deaths of millions of people. And now the Dutch government had to decide whether they would allow these people to start a nation, a nation that was multi-ethnic and that had ethnic tensions bubbling over, or whether it would intervene. And actually, in the next little section, I'm going to look at why I don't think they actually had a choice, but that things bubbled over to the extent where troops were needed to keep order. Only a very small part of the blood that has been spilt in Java during the past three years will ever seep into the light of day. This is an eyewitness account of someone who lived through the Bersiak period in the Dutch East Indies. But to change track slightly, the Simpang Club today in 2020 um, is a, a place in the city of Surabaya which has a plaque on it that was uh, erected by the Indonesian government to commemorate its historic role. And the plaque reads, this was an exclusive Dutch club. This is actually false because Englishmen were also allowed, but it was forbidden for natives and dogs. From September to November 1945, the PRI, the Pemuda Republic Indonesia, used it as their main headquarters in the fighting against the combined allied forces, which startled the world by its duration and tenacity. Now, what I thought was very interesting about this is that I first read this plaque and I took it at face value. I thought this is just the base of operations of the PRI, of the, the Rebel Foundation, the independence movement against the Dutch. But then I dug a little deeper and actually something very shocking comes up. And actually, this might reflect why there were a lot of comments saying, what, but no one was killed in Indonesia. There was no uh, mass murder or, or killings against Eurasians or, or Europeans that were committed during the Bersiak period, because apparently this isn't taught in Indonesian schools that this occurred during the revolution. Now, this is a description by William Frederick, who's a historian who recently wrote a, a very good article on the Bersiak period and what exactly happened there. And this describes as it was on the 15th of October 1945 and what was happening. And a quick content warning for anyone watching, some of the descriptions are rather gruesome. Other survivors reported seeing women tied to a tree and repeatedly stabbed in the genitals by young men with bamboo spears. A woman burned in the genitals with a cigarette, a father and son being killed by having their arms and legs hacked off, and people being forced to stare into the sun. People were seen being shot execution style, while others were sent off to the restrooms with the yell, Kakus, toilet, where they were speared or hacked to death. Many bodies were thrown into the canal behind the Simpang Club property, and others were taken to the cemetery at Kebang Kuning and buried in a mass grave there. It's rather incredible then that this plaque at the co to commemorate this site doesn't mention the hundreds of ethnic minorities of Europeans and Eurasians that were tortured and killed here. Um, and just to mention that the other monument dedicated to the Pemuda in uh, Indonesia, in, in Surabaya, is a statue, a monument of a bamboo spear, so the very implement that they were using to maim women at this place and, and maim other men and children as well. It seems very, very 
strange that there is no commemoration of these terrible acts that that took place here um, as there are commemorations for when Dutch soldiers carried out summary execution and did illegal actions just as there should be and as there is recognition and increasingly so and justifiably so in the Netherlands it seems strange that this isn't repeated in Indonesia and there isn't this recognition of what went on during the Persia period. Now Another interesting thing is that another eyewitness account from the uh, Simpang Club mentions that a, another of the leaders of the revolution, another important figure, Sutomo, was actually present at many of these maimings. And even though he personally denied that he knew what was going on, this was another thing that some people said in the comments was that, ah, yes, the Bersiop, you know, some people were killed, but it was it was militias, it was independent rebels, it wasn't the, the TNI, the National Army. Well, he went on to lead the TNI. He was one of the leaders, as, as we can see. And it's true that Sukarno, he was forced to declare the independence by the Pemuda. But as we'll see later on, they aren't entirely innocent in the killings that are going on. And they certainly knew that it was happening at the same time. Now, this figure, Sutomo, certainly is stirring up ethnic and racial hatred, as we can see from several of his speeches. He said, torture them to death, destroy those bloodhounds of colonialism to the root. The immortal spirits of your ancestors demand of you revenge, bloody revenge. What the Bersiot period refers to is the stoking of ethnic and racial tensions after the surrender of the Japanese in 1945, but before Allied troops had landed. And actually it continues after Allied troops had landed, and um, Fredericks makes a good point that it continued after the Dutch had got there as well. So it continued for a long time, this, this racial tension. And really what it was, was ethnic Javanese people, nationalists, and it started with Bermuda, which is the word for youth, in the cities and often these were the more well-educated uh, youths that had been um, really susceptible to the Japanese propaganda, the literary propaganda that was stoking up racial hatred and again that's why it's important to look at the Japanese occupation for then understanding the uh, revolution that occurs after that. Um, basically they didn't just target the Dutch but they also targeted the Indo group so this is a Eurasian group uh, of mixed Dutch and Indonesian descent, as well as ethnic minorities from within what's now Indonesia, so the Ambanese and the Manadanese, as well as the Timorese, and also the Japanese. And the Japanese, really, it's anyone that's connected to the Dutch in any way. Ethnic Chinese, I should add to that list as well. As we already saw, they had been victims of um, massacres, and actually my grandfather's regiment when he was in Indonesia one of their finest hours was saving a town of Chinese people from being killed by one of these very radical Pemuda groups that they managed to get there in time and to get them somewhere more safe and it's something I'm very proud of him for doing because I think racial tension man it's uh it's no joke you know it's scary it's scary stuff to look back and read through all of this and the fact that people turned on their neighbors during this time and committed such horrible acts as we saw from that eyewitness account it's it's horrible to think about anyway putting my historian hat back on i feel i should offer an explanation for why the japanese are included in that and that's because there were a lot of japanese soldiers stationed in the dutch east indies because of course they had been occupying it until the surrender happened after the second atomic bomb had been dropped and so you had this weird limbo phase where the Japanese were still technically in control, they were armed and in the countryside, but there were also these armed Indonesian nationalist groups that had been collaborating with the Japanese that had often been armed by them, but were also quite disillusioned with them because they hadn't been given the independence that they had been promised by the Japanese. And so the Japanese actually had come to an agreement with the Allies that they would you know, give up their arms once the Allies land, but they wouldn't arm the population. And some commanders followed this, but other commanders actually ended up supplying the Indonesians with weapons and other Indonesians would then go and capture Japanese garrisons after they had laid down their arms. And this then sometimes led to conflict and led to Japanese prisoners being butchered. And one of these occasions was the Bulu Prison Massacre, which about 130 Japanese soldiers who had surrendered and were imprisoned were killed by members of the Pemuda. And then this led to more fighting between Japanese and Indonesians um, around that area and on Java as it happened. And the Pemuda period then is a really brutal, violent period in which 
all of these racial tensions erupt. And even when the Allies land, as I, as I talked about in my other video with the Battle of Surabaya, the Pemura then turned on the Allies that were coming in and started to attack them, as well as the other ethnic minorities that were there. As I said, this Bersia period is largely forgotten by Indonesian historians and isn't something that's covered or something that the general public seems to be aware of. But actually, it really should be. And Robert Cribb described the killings of Dutch and Eurasians um, and, and also other minority groups, I should add to that as well, in the last months of 1945 constituted a genocide, albeit a brief one. And this really got some more interest in the world of academics. And I've already quoted Frederick's article, um, and it will be linked in the description below, by the way, as well as some other sources for this video. Um, I've already quoted him, but he actually takes this further and he analyzed Cribb's conclusion and actually thought that really more should be made of it than that even. He concluded that close study of the killings of Dutch and Eurasians in East Java prompts us to ask whether Cribb's designation of them as a brief genocide, the first time such terminology has been used, is warranted. The first word may be objected to on several grounds. First, that in fact the violence clearly continued past the Bersi update, and therefore was not as brief as Cribb implies. Second, that although there is scholarly disagreement over a definitional length of a genocide, current opinion seems to favour no limitations. And third, brief in this case perhaps inadvertently implies of lesser importance, or even less objectionable. Frederick estimated that the true extent of the killings has never been properly calculated as records were really hard to find during this time, but based on a multivariate analysis, he estimated the death toll for the Bersiop inflicted by the Indonesian nationalists was between 25,000 and 30,000 people, and that this constituted around 10% of Indonesia's entire Eurasian population that was murdered during this period, which is a very large amount considering that there were so many Eurasian people and just because they were half European or part European. Many of the Europeans who had just been liberated from Japanese internment camps there, where they'd undergone very harsh conditions and where a large proportion had died and who had just got out found themselves being herded right back in by the Indonesian National Army. Now Sukarno and other leaders said this was for their own protection, although he said in a letter to the British um, uh, very much that he could not guarantee their safety for more than four days from the Bermuda youths who were going around and slaughtering people in large numbers. But really what may have been the case here is actually that he was using these prisoners as bargaining chips. These were essentially European hostages as they were largely Dutch. This meant that he could use them in negotiations with the Dutch in an attempt to gain independence that he wanted and that he would be the man in power. This is a map of modern Indonesia and as you can see it's a very large place and it's made up largely of a lot of larger islands like uh, Bali, Sumatra, Java, of course, Borneo, but also many smaller islands. And if you look at a map of the ethnicities within this new state of, I say new state, within Indonesia, it's absolutely jam-packed with lots of different ethnicities and minorities and linguistic minorities, religious minorities and groupings, tribes, etc. Um, and this certainly was the case when the Dutch were there as well in 1945. And actually, just to demonstrate that Indonesia as a concept is something that was also created. The Dutch didn't arrive in the 17th century and find Indonesia as it is today under one leader and take over. That's not the case. What they found was lots of small independent entities and different groupings and so there's no reason to suggest that Indonesia is a natural form. That's as I said at the start of the video looking through the telescope from the wrong way and actually many people within the modern state of Indonesia do not feel a part of this state and that's why there were certain areas during the Indonesian National Revolution, the Polichinela Axis, that actually were loyal to the Dutch, some very very strongly so. 
And actually, I've put circles around the areas in Indonesia that have recently had armed insurrections against the government. And you can see there are quite a few different areas that have. Another point that I could make here, but that I won't, is that many of these areas, so particularly Timor, which you can see at the bottom, and New Guinea, which you can see right on the right of the map there, that these areas were not initially part of what would become Indonesia, nor were the Maluka Islands, which are the islands in the third circle from the left, which I will make a separate video on. And actually, it was in the interest of some of these peoples, like the Moluccans, like the Papuans, um, uh, and, and like people from the, the Timorese, these were all groups that were targeted by the Bersiap, and these were all areas that were highly loyal to the Dutch. And so actually, by sending soldiers, they were protecting these people from the mobs that were rampaging through many areas of what would become Indonesia, what was then the Dutch East Indies. And so you can also view the Politie Mela Axis as being just that, as being policing actions to protect these minorities that were being attacked by the Javanese. Now, there was a sense that these nationalists wanted to create an Indonesian identity, and I don't think it's the case that such leaders as Sukarno wanted to destroy the minorities or eliminate uh, Eurasians or Europeans. That's not the sense that I get from his letters or from his speeches. But there certainly was an element, certainly in the Pemuda, that was looking to do that. They had a very clear idea of what Indonesian was, and that mapped very closely onto being from Java, being Javanese. However, I still think for leaders like Sukarno and Hatta, there was a clear idea of what was meant by Indonesian and that some groups within Indonesia were given more priority than others. And this then maps onto why some groups were more loyal to the Dutch and in whose interest it was to remain with the Dutch and not under the yoke of the Javanese, which is what you saw happening after independence with their expansion and imperialism over other islands that continues to this day. And it's worth remembering that in 1927, when Sukarno founded his Partei Nacional Indonesia, Eurasians and Chinese people were banned from becoming members. And this is meant to be a national party for Indonesians. And a year earlier, actually, in 1926, Muhammad Hatta said that we cannot possibly count Indos as our compatriots. This being the case where there were hundreds of thousands of Indos within Indonesia. And that's probably why there are now so many in the Netherlands and in other countries, because it was no longer safe for them to stay within Indonesia, or perhaps they didn't want to, following the Bersiap period. And again, this may be why a lot of them joined the Knil and why certain areas were particularly loyal to the Dutch throughout the conflict. And actually, this leads to a lot of interesting history following the Indonesian National Revolution, which is something I'm going to be talking about in my later videos because this video is getting really rather long. However, I feel like we should have a quick summary. It could justly be argued that in the manner in which it occurred and the leaders involved in the declaration of its independence, Indonesia was a product of the Japanese occupation. Sukarno and Hatta had both aided Japan's war effort and collaborated with a regime that killed millions throughout Asia and against which the Netherlands had declared war. Now, I feel like I've underpinned this argument quite well with pieces of evidence that support Sukarno and Hatta being involved with the Japanese war effort, with collaborating with the invaders, and in helping them to the detriment of many of the people of Indonesia. And also that it was because of the surrender of the Japanese that there was this declaration of independence that occurred. That's not to say, once again, that Indonesia is somehow an, an illegitimate state, but this is simply to look and to question whether the independence of Indonesia and the leading figures should have been such as Sukarno and Hatta, given their questionable characters with regard to ethnicity in Indonesia, with regard to their having helped the Japanese beforehand, etc. And whether this is a good enough reason for the Dutch to say, hold on a minute, 
this is just a continuation from the Jap Japanese occupation. These are the same people that put people into prison camps, that beheaded prisoners, that took women away to be uh, forced into sex slavery, that took others away to be forced into indentured servitude, and that mishandled them so badly that large proportions of them died. Should they be the leading figures of a new independent country? Perhaps that also plays into it. Furthermore, the Bersiop can be arguably described as a racially motivated genocide, and I think that term should apply here, and I think it's underpinned quite well by the arguments made by Cribb and by Frederick as well. It was against certain minorities within the Dutch East Indies, not just against Europeans, largely Dutch people or those of mixed race descent, but also Ambonese, Madanese and Chinese people that were Timorese as well. These smaller minorities, and as I said, there are so many ethnic minorities within Indonesia. And then actually this chaos that was going on and that the Indonesian National Army, so the army that Sukarno was, was trying to create, actually did very little to prevent. And in actual fact, many of the Pemura group seem to have been armed by the National Army. So even if it wasn't the National Army physically going out and killing them, you know, they thought, well, it's roughly the same enemy at the same times. And so they really didn't save as many people as perhaps they could have done, despite the fact that Sukarno was rounding people up and putting them into internment camps. But what his motives there were, we're not entirely sure. So I don't think it's at that point reasonable to argue that the Dutch shouldn't have sent soldiers to go in and to sort the situation out to get people out of these internment camps that were there, out of these terrible conditions who were already weakened by the war, and to ensure that the racially motivated killings that were going on stopped. Now, of course, the Allies got there first. The British, largely British Indian troops, were sent in and were calming it down. But as Frederick has pointed out in his article, which I'll link below, the killings continued afterwards as well. And so I think a military presence at that point to safeguard the lives, which is the role of the, the, the ruling nation, was in order in that point. And a final point is that the Indonesian revolution was more a Javanese revolution. There were also quite a lot of support on Sumatra and on other islands as well. That's not to say that it's just Javanese. There, were, there was support on others, but there were also many regions that did not want to become part of Indonesia and that eventually uh, were, were dragged kicking and screaming to become part of it. Sometimes the, these areas were invaded, such as New Guinea or uh, Timor and other times they were in, in the Moluccan Islands as well, whereas actually they had rather stayed either with the Dutch East Indies and actually they were planning to make several of these areas independent, as I'll talk about in a future video, but that they had been treated poorly at the hands of the nationalists. These were also some of the victims of the Bersiop genocide, and that's why they didn't want to become a part of this revolution. And of course, if there had been no intervention, then the Declaration of Independence would have happened and they all would have been forced to join with this Javanese state. But what a Dutch military intervention was trying to do was to actually break this up. And we can see this by looking at things like the Dutch bargaining for the Lingajati Agreement and the Renville Agreement, that they were trying to split Indonesia between areas that were not wanting to become part of a, a Java central uh, Indonesian Republic and those that wanted to remain with the Dutch or go independent but in the end that was all in vain. All right everyone thank you very much for watching this has been a really long video uh, it's very late now and I've, I'm sort of losing the plot so I hope I haven't messed up anything particularly uh, poorly in in the last few uh, well the last 15 minutes of this video, but I hope it's been somewhat interesting and informative. I really would recommend taking a look at some of the articles in the description. I'm sorry it's been a little bit heavy, perhaps with some of the topics, um, and, and the articles aren't easy reading, especially the stuff about the Bersi up. Um, but I think it's so often overlooked. In all the documentaries I've watched that have been produced recently in the Netherlands, this is never mentioned in context of the war, and I think it's important. Again, and I feel like I should just reiterate, nothing against Indonesian people. I, I don't think that Dutch colonialism was a good thing and the Dutch certainly did awful things beforehand in Indonesia and there were crimes, war crimes that were committed during the war by Dutch soldiers. I think that's undeniable and this isn't a defense of that in any way, shape or form. 
However, I think this is important to bear in mind for why soldiers were sent in the first place and that it wasn't just simple greed that was the reason why they went. It wasn't just imperialism and colonialism that they sent soldiers over. There were other reasons for it as well. And ones that clearly a lot of people didn't know about. And I think that's why they commented. But anyway, um, let me know what you thought in the comments below. And uh, I, I will sign off there. So this has been The History and I have been Hilbert.